to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever, for He is good. He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever for the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise forever. Forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on, His love endures forever, yeah. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. with us forever, oh forever. God, we are grateful that you are faithful. We sing praise now. Sing praise. Our 
failures and our failures hang dead on the cross. You cannot be stopped. A mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Stand against our God. We stand on your victory and shout out your praise. Miracle maker, you're mighty to save. Awesome in power. Relentless in love, you cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. You cannot be stopped. There's nothing that can stop. Oh, you cannot be stopped. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing more. Mover of mountains, river of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. Oh, mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our against me but I will hold my ground I will not fear the war I will not fear the storm my help is on the way my help is on the way hold my God he will not delay my and strength always and I will not fear his promise is true my God will come through always always here we go trouble surrounds me abounding my soul will rest in you 
yes it will, Lord. And I will not fear the war. I will not fear the storm. My help is on the way. And my help is on the way. And the, the reason why I want to get baptized is so I can, so Jesus can tell me where to go, and so I can feel safe in life. And the people who helped me get baptized were my mom and my dad. I'd like to introduce you to Henry Whiting. Henry's coming before all of us to publicly publicly profess his faith in Jesus Christ. He talked to his parents, and then he went and spent some time with Ms. Lori, and now he's coming before all of us and invites us to celebrate with him today that Jesus Christ lives in him by faith. So Henry, based upon your desire to put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and based upon the teachings of the New Testament, it's now my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There you go, all right. Hey, we hope you've enjoyed the worship time. I know each week our bands get together, musicians and instrumentalists and vocalists, and uh, set it up for all of us, whether it's online or in person, to worship the Lord in a very, very powerful way. Hey, if you give through this local church ministry, I like to tell you each week a different ways that the money that you give and that our family gives, when we give through this local church, the way it actually touches lives. And so this week, I'd like to introduce you to something called Jensen. And I don't know if you've heard of it or not, but it's an amazing experience where uh, people between ages of 18 and 25 can actually spend a couple weeks experiencing what it's like to be a missionary. Now you might think, yeah, they're training them to be missionaries for a, um, an occupation or something like that. No, truth be known, they're helping them to learn that mis being a missionary is not something you just do uh, as a church project. It's not just something you get on a plane and go somewhere around the world, but you can actually have another occupation and have a missionary lifestyle. So part of the money that we give goes to help these uh, 18 to 25 year olds in this uh, time where they take six to eight weeks and get an experience of what it's like to be a missionary regardless of their occupation. So how exciting is that? That we are helping train the next generation 
to be missionaries 24-7, 365. So we invite you each week to consider in giving. You can see different ways that it impacts the lives of real, real people, and you can see the different ways to give here. Father, thank you again each week for the way that we realize and we understand more and more of how our giving, our investment in your kingdom financially goes to impact the lives of real people. And we've seen today, it goes to impact the lives of, of uh people between ages of 18 and 25, that ultimately whatever occupation, whatever job they have, they can live lives as missionaries, full-time serving you as they uh, impact the lives of other people. Thank you, Father, again, for showing us the many different ways you are using every penny we give to touch the lives of people. In your son's name we pray, amen. Hey, we'd like to welcome you online today to our message time. We pray that you've been really challenged and encouraged in the worship moment. And uh, just hope that today you'll really be sensitive to God speaking to you. Um, and as we go through this, this message today, if you have a spiritual step you'd like to talk to us about, have a question about the message, maybe just share with us that you're a guest or have some type of need, man, hey, let us know. You can either email us or text us there and we'll get back with you. We'll respond as quickly as we can. Um, each week, we're right now, we're walking through the series called Exodus, A Journey to Freedom. And we're wanting us all to understand that God desires to take us on a journey of freedom, literally an exodus from um, something that's mastered us, an addiction, a sin, an idol, uh, maybe a bad habit, a secret sin, to take us on an exodus from that over literally to freedom. Now, I want you to imagine in your mind 1963, the evening of November 22nd, a group of people are gathered in London, England in a giant playhouse, enjoying um, a satire on British culture. And everything meant there is uh, for humor, and everyone's laughing, cutting up, and this guy walks in for his job interview, a young man, and he's welcomed by a woman who wants to do the interview. And as he comes walking in, he has um, a radio and he, he's listening to the radio as a woman's talking, and the audience is put in the, the conflict of hearing the radio and hearing the interview. So the man puts the, t the radio down on a little table, turns up the volume, looked something like this, and turned up the volume, and so there the audience sat in the tension between hearing the BBC and the job interview. On this night, though, the BBC had an uncharacteristic news flash something that obviously had not been shared before. On this night, they said, and I quote, the American president, John F. Kennedy, has been assassinated. And at that moment, the young man who was playing the role of the, being, the guy being interviewed turned around as quickly as he could to turn the radio off, but by then it was too late. That one sentence had changed everything. The people on the stage, the people in the audience, even the actors and actresses, everything had changed with that one brief announcement. Now, now, you probably know that feeling, right? You know that moment when you had one sentence, one phrase, one statement that changed everything. You might have been a high school athlete and you went to, for, out for the team and you got the note that you've been cut. You might have been married and someone came home and said, I've had enough or I'm out of here or I found someone else or I don't want to do this anymore. Perhaps you went to see a doctor and the doctor said, um, things don't look good. I, I've got to tell you, the tests look bad. Perhaps you um, had a job experience where someone said, we're downsizing or we're making cuts in your area. It looks like uh, your job will not be around much longer. But, but we all know that moment when there's a statement, a sentence that changes everything. And so I'd like to begin with a statement that ought to change everything. 
And John writes these words, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. That, that if we claim that somehow uh, there's not an idol or an addiction or a secret sin or a destructive habit or something where we're living the way God did not design us to do or to live, that, that we deceive ourselves. We all fall short. We all have those issues in those areas. In fact, Paul describes his struggle beautifully. Paul describes it this way, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, the very thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Paul explains, you know, it's no longer myself who do it, who does it. I realize it's the sin living inside of me. And Paul describes that, that struggle, this thing just driving him. And uh, two Sundays ago, we called it an addiction. Now, when I say an addiction, for a lot of you, you naturally think of like drugs or you know, alcohol or something like that. But, but pull the circle back a bit and, and think of things like control, operating out of guilt, Per, you know, a, a desire to buy all the time, to be recognized all the time, to have pleasure all the time. This thing just driving us in a really, really messed up way. In fact, we had this definition of addiction a few, uh, two weeks ago, a compulsive need for something or someone. And, and we've determined it to be good for us, though it has nothing to do with God. In fact, it becomes what we might call an idol. It competes for God in our lives. We actually you know, are so, more sold out to that than even we might be to God. Now, before we return uh, to the story of Moses and Exodus, I'd like us to nail down two very defining truths found uh, throughout God's Word. Uh, the first one is found over in the book of, of Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And God looks at Adam and Eve and he looks at them and says, Hey, you know, why are you hiding behind the trees? Why are you sowing the fig leaves and hiding? And he says, who told you that you were naked? And at that moment, it, it sounds like an indicting question, but for God, it's, it's a reminder of something. Because you see, earlier we read this statement that Genesis 2, 25, that Adam and Eve were both naked and they felt no shame. There was no embarrassment for them at all. In fact, at Genesis 1, 31, at the end of the creation, as Adam and Eve are naked and they're engaging uh, God and walking around and doing life as God designed it to be. It was very good. God designed it to be something that was deemed to be very good. So what caused it to be a shameful thing? That's what God wanted them to understand. You've always been this way. Why a change in perspective on it? And we need to understand this first truth that living exposed where people know who we really are and know what's really going on and, and know with authenticity what we're all about. That is a good thing. And that's the way God designed us to live, to live transparently where people do see us and we're not hiding in any, any way, shape, form, or fashion from them. Uh, the second one, though, is uh, you know, a way that a lot of us get around this transparency. We, we understand the truth of 1 John 1, 9, that we, we confess our sins, that God is faithful and He's just, and He purifies us. And we feel good. Okay, I've confessed to God, and, and I'm restored, I'm cleansed. But we overlook one part, and it's this part that we overlook. It, it's James 5, 16. Not only confessing to God, but confessing to one another, and then we're healed. That's the reason a secret sin is so diabolical because we might confess it to God a thousand times, but it's a whole nother matter to confess it to people. Confess to God for forgiveness. Confess to people to experience healing. And you might think, why? Well, I could say it to you this way. It's a totally different matter for you and for me to confess to people we can see whose faces show disappointment and frustration and sadness with us. There is a, a healing moment there where there's accountability, there's encouragement, there's prayer, we can process it with people, and we see their response. There, there's a, a liberating moment to that. That's the reason I want you to understand this message series is so significant. Because I want us to know the level of our sickness, you know, the, the sick thoughts we might have, the desires that we'd be embarrassed for people to know about, the choices we've made, the habits, maybe secret habits we harbor deep inside or, you know, in a dark room or where no one knows. Those often reflect the depth of the secrets we keep. That the sickness, the level of that sickness reflects the depth of the secrets that we hide from other people where we're not living the fully exposed, transparent life. 
So as we go through this series and this message, especially this morning, I'd like us to, to, to break it down into two groups. Uh, group number one is those of us who are desperately wanting an exodus from an addiction, from a sin, from an idol, from a secret sin, from something we just feel like we can't stop, a habit, a desire, a relationship, anything that has mastered us, and we are longing to be free from it. It might be anxiety, fear, worry. It could be guilt and shame. Uh, the feel the need to prove ourselves all the time. The list is endless. And when these things master us and we're longing for that exodus, what can we know is true from God? It is this. God said this about His people. I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I've, I've heard their prayer. I've heard their agony. I'm concerned about their suffering. I'm going to rescue them, as he says there, and lead them out of the, where they are to a good and spacious place. In fact, I'm sending Moses uh, to, to help them. Now, as you look at that for a moment, I'd like us to highlight the first one, that, that, that God does everything in relationship. Notice he calls them my people. That, that God basis for activity in our lives is relationship. I mean, the basis for his response is our relationship with him, that he actually truly is working in our life because he loves us. In fact, for some of you this today, it, it might be a helpful reminder for you to understand Romans chapter 8. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who have a relationship with God, God does not condemn you. You might reap the consequences of decisions, but there's no condemnation. Why? Because of the relationship that you have with God. Now, now go back to the list and notice what it says, that God always sees what's taking place. He's keenly aware of everything unfolding. But not only does He see it, He hears you and me when we cry out to Him, when we, we pray and we wonder, is God listening? He's listening. And, and we're wondering if He's concerned, and, and God is concerned as He was for His people. And we can see also God has a plan of rescue. The difficult thing is it's in His timing, not ours. Patiently waiting on God and His plan, as opposed to the immediacy of the plan that we demand to take place. And then finally, God often brings others to assist us in our exodus. We might be waiting on God to develop the very person who's going to come and actually help us overcome and be set free from our struggle, whatever that might be. But do you believe that in your head? Do you, do you believe that in your heart? Is that information that you really cling to and, and you really believe to be relevant and powerful and true in your life? Have you ever heard of um, Oxford Analytica? It's a fascinating truth that uh, every day there's a group of, of scholars that gather at Oxford University um, and they gather about six o'clock in the morning and, and they're given information, maybe crop prices in China, uh, perhaps events in the Middle East, things in South America. And they put all that information together and they think about it and they, they process it together and they come out with a, like a, a statement or, um, excuse me, like a newsletter uh, that they release for people to see, uh, something for them to, to, to get. And people like the CIA and major corporations pay big money to read this uh, document, this release that they share. And Oxford Analytica understands something that the best leaders make the best decisions if given the best information. And so I'd like you to really think about it for a moment. Do you allow God's truth, His liberating truth, His information to just saturate your mind? Or might you be allowing things like discouragement and anxiety and fear and guilt and shame and all the things that, that might be operating out of deceit and lies to flood your mind? In other words, you're going to be making bad decisions because of bad information, or are you going to make some good decisions because of good information? And so in whatever situation you find yourself today addicted to something, battling, again, fear, control, security, power, pleasure, the list goes on and on and on. Understand, God wants to set you free in a very, very powerful way. We'll look at it, that in greater detail next week. But this morning, I'd like, or today, I'd like to look at another group, not just a group being helped, but here's the exciting thing is we're preparing ourselves to be helped by God. God also is preparing us to help other people. That would be the second group, the group that God wants to utilize us to help them experience an exodus.
Like we're waiting on God to help us experience an exodus. As we're waiting on that, God is developing us to help other people experience an exodus or liberation to freedom as well. And one of the places it begins is actually something I think most people don't understand. I think it's a perspective most churches don't have. And it is this, found over a statement written by Paul in 2 Corinthians 5. From now on, we don't regard people in a worldly manner. No more. We don't believe people to be uh, performance-driven. We, we don't believe in survival of the fittest. We, we don't label people. We don't judge them quickly. A lot of areas where churches go uh, in a bad way here is they get mad at unbelieving people for acting like unbelieving people. That's just who people are. Um, and, and people get very, very frustrated sometimes with that. But we want you to see our message. Our message is this. We want people to be reconciled to God. That's what our message is. We're not about their behavior, their, anything about them. It is about them being reconciled to God and then God actually going to work in them. I mean, here, here's our message spelled out. Our single goal is we want to help people get fully reconciled to God because we know when that happens, they will begin the journey of exodus, of leaving whatever is mastering them and experience the amazing part of freedom. I mean, we're never chained, excuse me, called and don't even possess the capacity to change anybody. I mean, I can plant a plant, I can prepare the soil, I can water, I can fertilize, but I still can't make the plant grow. Likewise, I can pray for someone, I can set an example for them, I can teach them, but, but I can't change them. Only God can do that. And when I introduce them to God and God begins that reconciling relationship with them, they position themselves for, for that journey, uh, that journey to freedom. And what is that journey? Again, you know, we've said this already. It's a journey where they'll experience their own exodus from their compulsive needs for things they determined to be good, something or someone, and it's not God. And so we can be developed not only to experience our own exodus, but be prepared by God to help other people experience an exodus in their own lives as well. So I'd like us for a moment, because Moses will be our key character on helping the people experience an exodus, I'd like you to see the story of Moses for a moment in Exodus chapter 2. Look at it with me. In Exodus chapter 2 verse 1, we see that a man from the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Now you think, what, what are you pointing at here? Well, it's this, truth, that, that God always has a plan. The people were begging and crying and pleading for God to do something amazing and send them deliverance and set them free. And God says, if you hold on, I'm right now raising up a little guy, a kid who's going to be a teenager and being an adult. And that guy will come and give you the deliverance that you so desperately want. In fact, God would say from the beginning of time, I've had a plan. The second part, return to Exodus chapter 2, we see the Pharaoh's daughter is taking a bath in the Nile and sees a basket with a baby in it and sends her slave over there. And the, the slave girl opens it up and looks inside and finds a Hebrew child. And uh, the, the lady, the, the Pharaoh's daughter felt sorry for the child and said, um, uh, you know, take this baby and raise his child and, and help, you know, and bring the child back to me when, when uh, the child's fully raised. It's an, a fully grown. It's an amazing thing to think about. Why? Well, because that same young woman who was bathing in the Nile, her dad had said this. He gave his order to all people, including his daughter. Every single Hebrew child that is a male should be killed. Now, when that baby was found, baby Moses was found, at that moment, Pharaoh's daughter should have said, kill it, drown it. We don't want it, dad said. But that isn't what happened. And so here's the second truth I want us to understand if, as we're on the journey of becoming someone to help others in their exodus is that God is always active in unfolding His plan. God's developing you. God's developing me actively right now, getting us ready to help others experience the exodus from what's enslaving them to the journey of what we would call freedom. Now go back to Exodus chapter 2 and look after Moses had grown up. He saw a Hebrew, an Egyptian, I should, beating up a Hebrew. And inspired by that and motiv motivated by that, you'll see he looked one way and another way, made sure no one was looking, at least he thought. He went and killed the Egyptian and hid the man in the sand and ran 
away from that, that, that place to pretend like everything was good. And so, you know, for you and for me, we might look and you might look at me and say, hey, hold on, you don't know me. There's no way God can use me. You don't know what I have done. Well, look back at the story here. You see, when we mess up, God has a plan. Because in that story, you know, we would think Moses, sorry Moses, you murdered somebody, it's over. God's like, no, you didn't cause a plan not to happen. It's going to be delayed a bit, but it's still going to happen because I am God. And I would take, challenge you to take a moment and grab a sheet of paper or maybe take your phone or tablet or computer, whatever you're watching this on, and write the phrase, um, a simple phrase, that goes something like, um, I once was, and fill in the blank, and then say, I was shown mercy and grace. You know, I, I once did this, I once said this, I once had this lifestyle. And then, by God's mercy, that was Paul. See, I once was a blasphemer. I was once a violent man. I killed people who were Christian believers. But Paul says, I was shown mercy. And I love what it says, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. So you might have the story of Moses. In fact, I think we all have the story of Moses where we can say, yeah, I once was, but God's word would say, but now you are what? Based on God's grace flowed out abundantly, basically grace, meaning God gave us the very thing we did not deserve. But as the story continues, we go back to Exodus chapter 2, we see the next day he goes out, see two Hebrews fighting, goes to them, and they say to him, hey, we saw you. We saw you kill the Egyptian. What are you going to do? Are you going to do that again? And Moses obviously ran because his reputation was ruined. And then Pharaoh what, learn what had happened. And when he heard, he tried to kill Moses as well. So Moses is running from his people. Moses is running from the Egyptians. Moses is running from the Pharaoh. Moses is on the run because he thinks everybody wants to get him or kill him. Can, can I get your attention for a moment? If you're watching this and uh, you're running from God, you might be running from an experience or running from guilt or running from shame or running from a decision that you made and you're running as fast as you can. Can I remind you of something that we find in Psalm 139? The, the writer says, you know, where can I go, God, and hide from your presence? I, I can maybe go up to the heavens. You're there. I can go into the deepest part of the deepest cave or the deepest ocean, and you're there. In fact, I can go to the far side of the sea, and for ancient people, that was a long trek, um, and you're there. The, the God, it doesn't matter where I go, you're there. Moses would leave Egypt and go into the wilderness and he'd be alone and he ultimately would be married and have a son. He'd be taking care of sheep on the back side of nowhere. And we learn this simple fact. You and I can run from God, but we can never hide from him. See, some of you are on the run right now thinking, you know, hey, God can't see me. I'm far away from God. God's given up on me and it's over. And God says, no, you can run from me but you can't hide. I always don't just find you. I've known where you've been the whole time. And then finally, we come to Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. During that long period of time, uh, the, the king died, the Pharaoh died, and another one comes to, to power. The people grown in slavery, God heard their, their cries, God heard their prayers, he remembered his covenant that he had with them, and God called to Moses from a bush. And here was the final part. Moses, there does come a time when God says, it's time for you to play a role in the life of another. It's time to go. It's time for you to get up and to follow that decision. And it's time for you to get up and go. Now you think, what does that look like? What does it look like when God says, all right, now's the time for us to take that step. Well, that's what we're going to talk about next week what it looks like for God to deliver us, and also what it looks like for us to play a role in the deliverance of others. I hope you'll join us next week. It's going to be an amazing time together. But before we go, I do know something. I do know, fully convinced, that there are still are some of you who are thinking, I don't have addiction. I don't have any idols. I don't really have any struggles. I've got a couple of sins here and there, or issues, but they're nothing big. I'm good. I'm all right. Well, before you get too comfortable, I'd like to um, steal a, I won't say a quote, 
Let's summarize something C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Problem of Pain. I love the way he writes, You and I can feel at peace living fully immersed in our sin, or he called it our stupidity, but our stupid decisions. But he said, the addiction that drives most of us the most, the idol, the God, the sin, the passion, the thing driving most of us in all of our lives, is pleasure. It's pleasure. In fact, he draws the analogy. He says, it's like a guy who has a great meal in front of him amazing food and great tasting stuff and, and, and eats it so quickly and so fast that the guy doesn't even taste it. And when he's done eating all that delicious food at a high speed, high rate, that he doesn't even taste it, uh, he's all of a sudden demanding more. He didn't even enjoy what he had and he devoured it quickly and, and automatically demanding more. It makes me think of this graphic, right? Someone who's just inhaling all of it as quickly as they can, not enjoying a single flavor of an onion ring or a chicken nugget or a piece of cake, not enjoying any of that stuff, inhaling all of it. And when they get finished inhaling it, they put their, put their, you know, their hands down and say, hey man, I just want more. Now you might think, well, I don't really think that describes me. I, I wouldn't say that's me. No, no I'm not a, a pleasure addict. Well, let me ask you this. Do you struggle with gratitude and contentment? Do you struggle being thankful for what you have and finding great pleasure in that moment? And saying, God, thank you for all that you've given to me. I realize I deserve nothing more, but thank you for what you've given me. And anything in addition to that is truly a gift from you. You see, it's a lot more subtle than we might think. And so, you know, I, I want you to really think over the next week as we prepare to get together next, next week. I want you to think deep, deep inside, this is the freedom God desires me to have, to be free from anything motivating me, anything pushing me, anything guiding me other than Him. Not fear, not pleasure, not greed, not a desire to prove myself worthy, not to prove that my dad was wrong or my mom was wrong or the kids who made fun of me in middle school are wrong. Not, not a desire to achieve amazing things, to bring recognition to myself, not, uh, not to attain power, not to make up for maybe a limitation I feel I have. But at the end of the day, God wants to rescue me, take me on an exodus journey to rid me of all those things that I can enjoy the freedom of living each day and allowing Him to lead me and all those other things and not really mean anything at all. The joy of being in a relationship with a loving God and following Him, and letting Him lead, and me follow, and trusting this, if He died for me, and loved me that much, certainly He loves me enough to lead me each day into a life of freedom with Him. So Father, we're thankful that You have shown us today through the life of Moses, that You desire us to be delivered, to go on a journey of exodus with You, and You also desire us to play a role in, in the deliverance of others, of leading them on their own journey, to freedom. So Father, help us to get ready this week for the time we get together next week to understand exactly what that looks like to experience freedom and to be a part of delivering freedom to the lives of others. We bless you and we are amazed again by your love for us. In your son's name we pray. Amen.